we're going to be looking at forces, free body diagrams, and equilibrium. That's why I put this in my here. Why are Newton's laws such cheapskates? Because they always want free body diagrams. So what are these free body diagrams? So what that means is you have an object. Let's just say you just draw yourself an object like this right here. And you just start drawing all the forces acting out. So maybe there's a force going upwards and a force going downwards and a force going that way or something. And then you can use this to figure out what happens. So the key thing, first of all, is to remember we're going to add up all the vectors and we're going to figure out what's called a net force. Okay, so I like to call that F net. That's the key here. Now, remember that force is measured in Newtons. Okay, so I'll just say F, that equals the force as measured in a unit called Newton. They're named after Newton for Newton's laws. So keep in mind, this is really, really important. We'll put this around like this. So let's talk about just some of the forces. Uh, we're going to consider some forces here. Ooh, by the way, if you're really being careful, it should have a little vector symbol on it. Um, let's consider just a person standing still then. So here's just you standing on the ground, for example. So what kind of forces are acting on you? Um, what could you say then? Because what we normally do with a free body diagram is we actually just draw forces coming directly from the center of someone. So I'll just draw them in black, uh, in uh, blue, for example. So right now, let's just assume this is my center of mass right here in the middle. And I'm going to draw a force going downwards. There must be a downwards force. And we're going to label that Fg. That's the force of gravity. And we can often write it as m times g. That's because f equals ma, and a is the acceleration due to gravity. There's a few different ways to do it. But I'll just leave it as Fg, force due to gravity. But if there was just that force, then I'd be going downwards. We're going to learn later in another video that um, unbalanced forces cause acceleration. So if this was the only force acting on me, I'd be accelerating. This is basically the force on me. If there's no air resistance and I just jumped out of a plane, this would be my free body diagram. But I want to be still. I want there to be ground there. So if I'm standing there on the ground and I'm not accelerating upwards or downwards, there must be a force that's canceling out the, the uh, gravitational one. In this case right here, for example, I would draw an equal and opposite. I don't know if I do it exactly the same length, but we call it Fn, the normal force, for example. And that one would be canceling out the gravitational force, and that's what we're actually feeling right now. So right now, for example, as I sit here, uh, whoops, I just need to remember how to spell it, gravitational. For example, this is an example of a very simple force, uh, sorry, free body diagram here. So if I was just uh, standing here like this, so here this is my downwards force, upwards force, they cancel each other out. So that means then, you know, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going to accelerate anywhere. So that's kind of nice to know. That's the normal force. There's lots of other things, right? You could be having a forward force and a backwards force. All sorts of things can happen. But just to show you at least free body diagrams, that's in general how we do them. So when we deal with more complicated situations, it's important to know how to add two vectors. So for example, let's just say I had this uh, object right here. And let's just say it's got a you know force going upwards acting on it. So that's F1, let's just say. And it's also got another force acting to the right, let's say F2. Well, I mean, I could, I could actually just a free body diagram. I could draw them right here like this. That's true. That's my free body diagram. But if I want to figure out the resultant force, you know, then I could actually, for example, um, I could add these two vectors up and figure out what the sum is. In other words, if I did this, I could actually figure them out and say, okay, well, that was F1. And if I wanted to do F2, you always add vectors head to tail. In other words, the head of one of them is the tail of the other one. Let's say it went like this. And that means my resultant force then would be something that goes like this. This would be like, you know, my total force, which is F1 plus F2. That's how you add vectors. Just to show you a nice uh, quick way to see that, I always like uh, animations by PHET, so that's uh, from University of Colorado, they're awesome. So let's just say I take this uh, vector right here, I have this vector right here, B. Now of course, if I want to add these two, ve I mean vectors can be picked up and moved, they just can't be changed in length or in direction. So this is a vector, let's just say this is like me flying in my plane, and this vector represents my speed. So let's say I'm flying exactly north, okay, I'm in my plane, but then there's a crosswind. There's some wind that's, you know, acting to the east, for example, I and mean, it's a smaller force, let's just assume, something like this. Well, in order to figure out what's really going to happen, I'm going to end up which way? Well, I have a, a velocity going this way, but I also have a velocity going to the right. 
to add them up, I just go like this. I place them together like this, head to tail. And then the result of them will be something like this. Now this one allows me to do it by just pressing sum. It makes me a vector. And of course, I can move it to see, does it really work? Yep, it does. So that's the key to these, right? And no matter how I move this, do you notice that it would sort of change the sum because I could always add them up. Why is this helpful? It's helpful in so many ways in physics. It's like adding vectors is so important because there's lots of quantities in physics that are actually vectors. So it's really important to be able to deal with them. And remember, the length of the arrow represents the magnitude of the force. So this would be a bigger force than the one to the right, something like that. So let's look at kind of a sneaky example. I like this one. They tell you that three different forces act on an object, but notice they don't tell you what direction. They could be any direction. But they're saying, what's the maximum resultant force? In other words, if I added up all these three different forces, what's the maximum? Let me show you an example of what's not the case. Let's just say this right here is my object. Let's say in uh, black, I'll just draw a little dot. Let's say, I don't know, I have a, uh, maybe I have the, let's say the seven Newton force this way. Um, and I'll make that, you know, long. And then maybe I have the four Newton ones. That should be a little bit more than halfway the length. So four Newtons like this. And then I end up with uh, maybe the two Newton one also going to the right. So maybe like this here, also the two Newton one. If I figured out the total resultant on this, there's seven to the left. There's six to the right. So what's the real result? The real result is, let's see, 7 to the left, 6 to the right, 7 minus 6 is actually 1. So therefore, the resultant force will actually just be a little itty-bitty force of 1 newton to the left. That's not a very big number, so that's probably not the configuration I should choose. However, if you're smart about it, you could think, hmm, well, what's the longest I can make this if I'm adding up these vectors? What if you just add them, all three of them, up in the same direction? So maybe you had this one here, which is 7 newtons. And then you added to it uh, maybe the four Newton ones. So this should be about that long. It's not exact, right? But you notice, oops, I don't know what happened there. So something like this maybe. That's my four Newton one. And then I add the two Newton one, which should be half of that, something like that. This is, I think, the longest I can make it. And it would be seven plus four plus two. So that's seven plus six. So that means 13 Newtons. So this is an example of you know something interesting you could set up. Believe it or not, this was a question, something very similar to this showed up on an exam. So this is something that could be there. This was on a paper uh, 1A, which is, uh, you know, your multiple choice one. So something like that could really happen. So we have something we call translational equilibrium. Equilibrium implies the word equal, doesn't it? So that's when the resultant force is zero. So what do I mean by a resultant force? Okay, so if you add up all the forces, all the different forces on your free body diagram, if you add them all up, if they all cancel out, then you have what we call translational equilibrium or just equilibrium. So the key thing here is we have this quantity we call a net force. That's what I like to write like this, like F net. Okay, so when your net force, in other words, F net equals zero, then you have no acceleration. This is really important. It's actually related to Newton's second law, which says that if you have an unbalanced force, then you have acceleration. We're talking here about balanced forces. All the forces are canceling out. So for example, if I've got my super awesome plane drawing here, let me draw some of the free body diagram here. Let's assume all the uh, everything starts from the center here. So let's assume the plane is moving to the right. And okay, so what are the forces acting on it? We're gonna have a downwards force. I can call that FG, force of gravity. Um, so maybe I'll label it that. So that's uh, maybe I'll just write like that. I'll say that's gravity. So we'll also have an upwards force. I'm going to try to draw it equal and same length. That'll be lift force. So that'll be the force of lift. Okay, it's going upwards. So the upwards force of lift and the downwards force of gravity should be canceling out. All right, so that part's in equilibrium. But there's also forces going forward and backwards. So there's a forward force called thrust. So that's actually caused by the engines. So the engine of this plane here is moving it forward. But if that was the case, it'd be accelerating to the right because it wouldn't be in equilibrium. These two would cancel out, yes, but then it'd be accelerating to the right. So then let's uh, have a same but backwards one. We'll call it F drag or air resistance. So these are some of the key things that are going on here. And in this case right here, with the way I've tried to draw it, in this case, if you've got all the forces canceling out, it's in translational equilibrium. Now that doesn't mean it just falls out of the sky. You see, this is the really key thing right here is that you can still be moving.
So in this case, we would say, oh, because they're all canceling out, it's going to be in constant motion. It's not accelerating. That's it. So translational equilibrium really just means the resultant force is zero, but you can still be moving. That's why I put this awesome one here at how planes fly. <laughs> Magic, air, who knows? There we go.